There's no telling how much this time this would take, so I don't think anybody else could predict. Emma, you good to go? Welcome. Good evening and welcome to the meeting of the Soquel Creek Water District for January 15th. Roll call will find all of the directors here, thankfully. There are no public hearings tonight, so the first item on tonight's agenda is the consent agenda. Is there anything anyone wishes to remove from consent? Oh, yeah. Uh, 3.7. Okay, item 3.7, standing committee assignments. Anyone else? Uh, um, if someone from the public wants to ask something come off of consent, that's fine. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, uh, resident of the community of Aptos. I would like to take off item 3.1 and item 3.5. And I had I had something on three point nine. Okay, so I move all the others then. Second. The other consent items have been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. So the um, item three point one was removed. That's the minutes. So. That was not from the directors, that's from Ms. Steinbrenner. So that item is up now if you had a question or a comment. I'm a comment on the minutes. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. I have um, for your board and for your staff, um, I have a copy for Mr. Basso, he's not here. I have a formal um, letter of protest regarding the action to approve resolutions 1830, thank you, and 1831. But isn't that something specifically about the minutes? Um, well, uh, when would you like me to discuss? Probably under oral communications would be better. Because okay, that's not a correction to the minutes. Or, or 6.2 has uh, or update 6 on pure water so Yeah, okay. So item, on, item 6.2 would be the best time because this is really for just to see if the minutes are correct or not, or make corrections. Okay. Not to go over any item that was on the minutes. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought that uh, any item within the minutes could be discussed, no. and this was a rather huge or, one. Right, so, or, yeah, right, exactly. So that item will be item 6.2. All right, thank you. Um, do you want me to stay here for? Uh, I would wait. 
three five. Five. Please have a seat. We have a couple more. Have, uh, three five. She's doing. Oh yeah, three five. Um, well, let me first move three one. Yeah. I'll second. Approval of the minutes. Item three point one has been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> All right. So we'll go to item I, three. I did like these minutes. <laughs> good level of detail. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, it was good. Well done. So production reports. Item three point five. Thank you. I have some questions about um, the production reports. First of all, um, I, um, I have a question about the O'Neill well, but should I wait and ask that during the staff organization-wide reports? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So on top of that then, I have a question on page 239. Um, there, it discusses water from um, imported water from Central Water District. I'd like um, an explanation about that. And um, also noting that the... Sorry, I'm not seeing 239. It's at the, it's at the bottom. It's the bottom, December, 27 units. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, it wasn't a discussion. I thought you said a discussion, mm -hmm. okay. And I would like... Um, Again, I, I do want clarification, but that will come later about what's going on with the O'Neill Ranch well. And I also um, note that um, the, the use was up and uh, over water budget, but it showed the production down, and I thought that was interesting. So. Um, if we could just have, if I could just have some clarification about that, I would appreciate it. And um, just noting, I didn't bring it up in item 3.3, but uh, just noting that $1.6 million was spent in one month alone for Pure Water SoCal. Yeah, that's, that's really, that's, I'd like you to stay on the item, please, mm -hmm. that you're talking you. about. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, item 3.7. Oh, 3.7, standing committees, it's on page 248. And I just wanted to, uh, I don't have any correction to it, but I noticed that I was the chairman of three of those three committees. And I thought one of the, and I know one part of the reason why it's happened that I predominant on these committees is because they're during the day. So I wanted to agendize a, discussion about moving the, at least the WR the infrastructure, the water yeah, water. <laughs> right. whatever it is, infrastructure meeting right. to after five o'clock so that other board members could participate, you know, either five or six o'clock or five to six or 5.30 to 6.30. But okay. that's for the future because it would require polling uh, the other committee members who are the citizens right right and uh, so we can address so it wouldn't be addressed before the next meeting in February so but okay just a note that's all I had I didn't okay we'll put that on for a future uh, agenda item. and I move approval of three seven I'll second <coughs> okay it's been moved and seconded all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. and we haven't approved three five yet no we didn't we skipped right through it we have to approve production reports well it's uh, no, I think it's information. It's a report. It's a report? Okay. It's just information. And, um, on, and, and the report on item 3.9, there, there, were, there were two things that I just had on page um, 253 yeah. on the first groundwater modeling. I'm, it's probably Montgomery and Associates, just so people don't wonder, what's Monterey Associates? I don't know. It's our, <laughs> isn't that our groundwater modeling? team yeah okay, okay. My, thank you okay just just so we have yep. the report yep. in yep. case people are confused right. yeah. I just have one more comment to yes. on the consent agenda in general and I was wondering this uh, consent agenda was particularly long it was hard to f get through to the different items and I was wondering if we could tag each individual item the way we bullet uh, the main item numbers that we could do some sub bulleting uh, so that you can search for it on the computer more easily. Um, oh. I can, on I'm my computer, I see it. 
is a oh, bookmark. Oh, I see it, but if you wanted, if you were looking at the agenda and asked for 3.6, you'd have to scro scroll. I have to scroll through the Oh, whole okay. Thing. We can work on There's a way to open that consent agenda up to get to it specifically. Yeah. So maybe we, we can meet. And if that doesn't work, we'll, yes. we'll find another way. Yeah, Carla, if you look what's on the your, screen, <clears throat> you can hit this like that and then it so opens. So, what software is that? What is that program? Uh, this is Adobe Reader. Yeah, Adobe. I can I can work with you on that, and then if it doesn't, we'll 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 take a different. We'll see whether I can show you how to do it on that advice. If not, we can modify it. I okay. Have a different one. Okay. So let's let's. Okay. We'll okay. Thanks. Item, um, Thanks very much. Okay. okay. Um, that is all for the consent agenda, and so now um, it will be time for oral communications. Um, just wanted to remind people that there is an item. Um, item 6.2, which will have to do with an update on the community water plan and pure water SoCal and surface water pilot project. So that's item 6.2. So if there's any um, oral communications on items that are not agendized, now would be the time. So let me clarify, you'd prefer I talk about SoCal about pure water SoCal. Pure water SoCal will be under that item 6.2. 6.2. Okay, thank you. Um, then I will do that. I um, attended the Saturday's uh, Santa Margarita Water Basin workshop that was excellent. It was in Felton, and the title of it was Growth How to Water and Growth mix and I can't that's not exactly what it was but it was tying the two together and I've commented many times that in this county at the planning department there's a real disconnect between the planning department and the water needs for development and uh, that workshop was really good and I'd encourage you if you were not able to go it was very well attended by the way Saturday morning from 9 a.m. to noon in Felton Community Hall it will be uh, put up soon on the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency website It was excellent and John Laird opened it by uh, really talking about how important conjunctive use regional solutions are for um, our water future so I hope that you take that to heart I um, also want to point out, I did notice that work has begun on the district's uh, project at Twin Lakes Church. And um, many people don't know what that is. And I do see that the required sign has been put up, but it is difficult to read uh, because it's mesh. So it's only readable for people coming down the driveway from Twin Lakes Church. And they're not looking up there. They're watching the traffic. Uh, as I speak with people out in the public, no one knows what this is about. I would like to ask that the sign be made out of a different material so that it can be read. Uh, the problem with the mesh is when you look up to read it through the sky, you don't see what the, the writing is. It's pretty impossible to read. So I'd like a solid, um, material for the sign and have it put on um, Cabrillo College Drive. Um, I am really disappointed that that project went through and I, again I want to protest it because in reading the uh, mitigated negative declaration for it uh, the consultant stated it would be gravity feed and now Director Daniels, I see why you said that, that it would be gravity feed because that's what your consultant said. That's not true. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can I address that when you want? Hmm? Is there anyone else that wishes to address us on uh, an item not on tonight's agenda? All right, seeing none, board members. Alrighty, um, then we will move along. Um, next item on the agenda will be um, the reports, organization-wide status report. Yeah, so we'll, we'll get each uh, manager to present, and there will be no report out from 
council, obviously, Bob Basso's not feeling well. Yes, Mr. Basso's ill, I think, tonight. Hello. For conservation and customer service, I didn't have anything to add to the report, but I did want to bring in um, some signage that we'd previously um, put together with board input for the water demand offset program and outreaching that for the development projects that um, have gone through the program and, and met their offset requirement. So I don't know if, if that was brought up at the prior meeting um, that uh, you'd like to see some more outreach and you wanted to agendize that item. So I wanted to bring this in just to kind of um, refresh where we left off and see if I can get some ideas for uh, what you'd like to see when we do bring that back. Okay, that'd be great. Any do you have any thoughts since I was something well, that's, you Well, that's certainly bigger than what we've been using, but I'd say we should make it be a uh, site. So, for example, if it's the Aptos site, mm -hmm. I mean, the signs there are like that wide and about six feet tall, and this is not going to be seen because it's across a parking lot and across the railroad tracks. And so something even bigger on that site. But okay. Yeah, for, for a home, that's, that's fine. I'd okay. But so the content is probably still appropriate, and I mean, I can bring it back as an item on maybe the next board meeting but well personally I would get rid of the I don't know what it is the gray stuff there and just make the lettering water. be even bigger that's okay. water huh? that's water okay I'll take your word for it right yeah maybe we could ask the outreach committee to Take a look at it and give some suggestions. That sounds okay. good. But I'd like to get your input too. Yeah, making it bigger. Yeah. Were there any questions on the report? I seeing none. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. By the way. Yeah. Mm. Good evening. I'll be addressing some of the um, surface water. Uh, purchase from the city um, in 6.2, but um, I do want to make note and draw your attention that the city is beginning their um, aquifer storage and recovery testing at Belts 12 this Friday, mm -hmm. and that's the okay. first cycle of their testing, and that's a one-day um, storage and a one-day recovery, and then they're going to go to a seven-day and then a 30-day, and it's going to go all the way through, the, through June. So we're coordinating with the city closely on that for um, monitoring with private wells as in addition to um, monitoring wells. So that data will, of course, be shared with us and, and we'll share it with you as it comes available, but we are monitoring that. Um, any other questions? So on that, Taj, the, I, what they're trying to find out is how well the area receives water and how quickly it loses water right because that's different than what we're proposing for pure water soquel which would be dedicated recharge wells these would be both recharge and extraction okay so it's yeah storage and recovery i noticed they had some concern about interference with our wells and vice versa that you know, that's right and so what have you what have you come up with to I, well, I, they, they wanted us to take O'Neill Well off, mm -hmm. and, and we're going to be doing that tomorrow afternoon offline. Okay. Uh, it'll help just eliminate one more equation to the data that <clears throat> they, can, they can further extrapolate once um, they get their drawdown data and draw up data. Mm -hmm. They can apply that to our existing drawdown, that historical drawdown that we know of. Um, the, the two wells, the O'Neill and the Belts well, Belts 12 well, are very um, closely connected, connected mm -hmm. hydraulically, and so, um, you know, we're trying to coordinate our pumping when it's not, when they're not doing their testing. We do try to uh, alternate and pump in the day versus the night so that they're not both on at the same time. I was wondering um, how that tamping down the O'Neill well for that those periods of time interacted with the surface water pilot project and the delivery to that neighborhood yeah I think we're probably bleeding into O&M's status report but I um, know I, I saw. Yeah. yeah and so I mean I can 
we can co co present if you want Christine come on up here um, we initially started before we got um, permission from the state because we're experimenting with the ammonia issue at O'Neill and so we asked the state for a, a, a waiver to increase the hypochlorite dose this is all, all in the ONM status report but and so we wanted to, to practice and check out the data before the city started their ASR test so that's why we we ended up running O'Neill and scaling back a little on the inner tie transfer so it got cut down um, about by half um, for three weeks or so and uh, we did get some valuable data we still would like to you know we're we're excited to start up that again after the city's finished but it's it'll be intermittently used um, weekly but very short time just to make sure that it's an available source for us but once the city's done we'll resume our our ammonia testing with permission from the state did that answer your question about how those are tied together I mean I did and then how we were going to work with the <coughs> city to go to deal with uh, on and off of an O'Neill well is what I was concerned about yeah we don't want to interfere with their data collection and so I think um, I think we've worked it out mm -hmm. yeah and so have there been uh, discussions at the staff level about the fact that the aquifer storage and recovery site and O'Neill will interact and how the, we might operate in the future if there was if they were going to do aquifer storage and recovery at that site no we haven't had those dialogues yet all right at some point we will have to have those yes. um I noticed under the TCP that everything's on hold. That I'm was wondering. my question, too. You can't have it. I got it first. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can have it. No, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> on hold until? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Christine probably wants to hear that answer, too. <laughs> um, well, we are, we are pending our day in court with, uh, with that mm -hmm. uh, legal uh, case. Um, but in the meantime, we were directed to move forward by by the our consultant <coughs> in that legal challenge and so it's really an availability of staff we've got a lot going on sure. um, once we get our new engineering tech up to speed we can kind of pick pick certain things back up I think if Christine had her choice I think she'd probably say Soquel Drive cast iron main replacement perhaps I'll let her say but you know that's a real high priority project as well which I think it had another leak on the status report over this last reporting period so um, if you guys want to try to expedite something we can shift other priorities around but we're pretty full we have uh, a pretty full plate with other people's projects the Capitola library has initiated construction in fact tomorrow we there's a pre-construction meeting for that and again that's um, a whole relocation of a water main that goes through the parking lot um, and so we are we are engaged in that we have the Aptos village project that is nearing completion but a very large project with respect to infrastructure and then the Rancho Del Mar shopping center is also on our our plate to to make sure is administered correctly so that ties up one of my engineers pretty sure pretty full time in addition to you can see the number of uh, new services that have been coming in so um, what's the compliance date for TCP when do we start oh it's uh, it's now it's it's in effect okay all right it yeah so we, we so that well is offline that's kind of high priority that well too. is offline yeah. yeah okay all right thanks you're welcome mm -hmm. right Christine um, the only thing I wanted to add to um, my status report was that uh, regarding the O'Neill Ranch ammonia evaluation, um, it looks like we did have our dose stabilized over the past week, um, and it stabilized right around um, the maximum use level. Um, that is after two, uh, it takes about two hours for it to stabilize, so the 
first two hours it's on, every time you start it off, um, the dose is increasing. So overall, the average is, dose is significantly less than the maximum, but it looks like for the past week, um, it had stabilized like right around that level. So, which is good news. It's um, encouraging. Um, and I, you know, I, I kind of wish we could do a little more uh, testing on that, but um, I guess we'll have to pick that up um, after the ASR test is finished, um, or at least until after the water transfer is finished. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Oh, I actually, I had Wait. one question. <laughs> I was couldn't figure out where it was. Um, well, I noticed in 19, uh, 2017, there was a peak in repairs and, uh, you know, repairs required and, and view of like the rainfall we've had this week and the portent for the rest of the winter. Do you anticipate a higher uh, damaged main rate, I guess? Uh, um, you mean with regard to the repairs winter? Needed, yeah, for, for um, winter. Actually, our, our leak season is the summer. I'm not sure if that's because why that is exactly. Um, it might be temperatures of soils. I'm not really sure, but um, Maybe uh, we did have last year, not 2000, 2017, we had the highest number of service repairs um, since we've been calculating that. Um, I'm not sure why, but it did um, drop back down to, to more average levels. I noticed that. I noticed that. Yeah. Okie doke. Thank you. So we go on to special projects. <coughs> what we have comments? Yeah, we'll do it at the end of the report, okay? Okay. It yeah. Well, I think you you had asked pr actually asked to have it at the end so that you instead of at the beginning. It's either the beginning at the or the end, but not at each one. Okay. So sometimes you do. So Okay. I well, sorry. I was trying to make it at the end so everybody had a chance to hear it first. Yeah. So special projects? I don't have any um, anything to add unless you have questions. And a lot of the information that special projects and communications is doing is in item 6.2. But specifically for some of the outreach activities, is uh, the team is looking at developing a communications and outreach plan for 2019. Got some feedback from our public outreach committee, and we will be bringing that back um, at the next meeting. Okie doke. And finance? And so for me, I just wanted to kind of expand upon my last item there, the low income rate assistance um, yeah. uh, draft report that was issued by the State Water Resources Control Board. We did have a chance to review that and I don't know as the district necessarily needs to offer public comment. It looks like this program is not <coughs> something the district would administer, it would be administered by the state. Um, our responsibility would be just to inform our customers that the program is available. Um, it looks now like it would be made available to uh, households that were 200% or less of the um, federal poverty level. And the funds would be dispersed either as a credit on their electricity bill or on a... You mean water? No, electricity. Um, they found that most low-income residents don't have water service in their name. They're either tenants or members of a... a multi-residential community. So most of those people wouldn't benefit from a credit on the water bill. They do find, however, that most low-income residents do have an electricity bill in their name. Mm -hmm. So they're thinking that they can offer th the water credit on the electricity bill through the CARE program. Or they could issue it as a direct cash benefit on an electronic benefits card through a program such as CalFresh. So those are the mechanisms that they are looking at now. We would just have to inform our customers that the program was out there should they choose to apply. Okay. So low and people who qualify for this would get a credit for their water, but it wouldn't go to the water bill. Right, it would appear as a credit on their electricity bill, which presumably would free up household sure. income to be used toward their water bill or it would appear as a uh, cash like on a visa card through the CalFresh program they would have a credit on that that would give them cash that could be used 
for other things, but would then free up their, their money to pay their water bill. It, is it appropriate for us to comment on the levels that are in the report? In terms of the poverty what, what, level? What, no, what the, the credits would be? Um, the credits are actually based on the um, agency, the individual agency's average bill, assuming an average bill is 12 units of water. So they've got three tier levels. They've got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Mm. If you're a tier one level, that's a fairly inexpensive water bill and you would get a 20% discount off the bill. If you were in tier two, that's a medium range bill, you'd get a 35% discount off the bill. And if you were in tier three or were with an agency that had higher water bills for a 12 unit bill, then you would get a 50% reduction off that bill. And so those are, the, those are the levels of credit that they're considering offering. So we can comment on any of it. I just, after seeing where the state arrived at, uh, at the program, I didn't know if it was something that the district took objection to. We don't have to administer it. I think for us, for our agency, our customers would, apply for, would, would qualify for the 50% discount Thank on a 12 unit bill. So it doesn't matter how much water they actually use, they would get that 50% of a 12 unit bill discount every month. Okay. So and, and if you would like me to respond, I'm more than happy to, but I just wasn't sure that the district had any Is comment. it necessary, I guess? Is, it's is, not necessary. I mean, in terms of the, if, we're su if we agree with it and are supportive of it, is there a need to let somebody know that we are supportive of it we could write a letter of support yeah we could do that our, our opportunity to respond is february 1st okay i would like to see a, a letter a of brief, support brief letter of support but there's not going to be a meeting between now and then right so but i'm but we can just draft something saying the district has reviewed <coughs> your draft report and is in in support of the recommendations you made is that that's fine. Are you comfortable yeah. with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been waiting, I've been hoping there'd be some relief for low income people. So it's great. What did I you say it. the income was supposed to be? 200% of the federal poverty level. About 70,000. For a four person household, I think it's about 56,000. Okay. So households making 56,000 or less would qualify for that program. I, I would, since I haven't had a chance to read the report and won't have a chance to comment, maybe a more generic in support of the concept okay. would be more appropriate. Okay. Because there could be things that, specifics that we might not totally agree with, but support of the concept I think would be. Is, do I have to make a motion? Letter, well, uh, yeah, it'd probably be, probably be good. Yeah. Um, and Can you, we do, do you want? It's uh, on agenda. Uh, yeah. 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 I'd, I'd say so just, just take like direction. Just direction with staff. Okay. Just to, to trust that we can get a reasonable, you know, supportive letter that's not necessarily super specific. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. not, nothing that Sign, takes more signed than. Signed by staff yeah. or board yeah. staff. You don't need okay. to sign it. Up to yeah. you. Doesn't matter. As long as it puts our okay. district. Okay. We'll leave it to the. Okay. Leave the general manager. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see, Tracy. I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. You're our lawyer tonight. <laughs> um, I am not your lawyer tonight. I just wanted to um, remind the board that we're still in recruiting season. And our final wrap up, just to give you a recap in terms of a uh, number of recruitments, just since June of 2018, we actually recruited and filled six positions, um, which is pretty significant for a small agency with 45 employees. Um, and we are still in the process of filling one vacancy that was created through an internal promotion. Um, the other thing I wanted to remind the board, which is included in my report, is the next board meeting. Um, we do have agendized and scheduled for our mandatory um, ethics training that will happen between five and seven that Bob will be um, presenting. Right, so the, the actual regular meeting will start at 7 p.m. that night for the members of the public. Right, right. We'll have that on the agenda. Ethics training highlighted. Yep. People are welcome to come to that too. But yeah, um, and, and but, there will but, be other uh, agency members uh, right. just to help them. Are there other agencies coming in Scotts Valley? Uh, I, uh, there's some indicated that they're coming, okay. so we'll see how it pans right. out. Okay. 
fire to water. Okay, and so we go to general manager. Yeah, so I'll just highlight two things. One, this was, there was an article in the um, Good Times, and it's cited there. And what kind of struck me was, you know, as we look to do multiple projects uh, to help solve the overdraft problem and, and Santa Cruz's problem too, of short during drought, that uh, you know the streams have taken a uh, uh, the fish at least have taken a beating over the years. In the 60s, it says here there were tens of thousands of steelhead. Uh, salmon migrated up the San Lorenzo each year, and now um, there was it's decreased from uh, since since then to uh, in 1997 about 80 fish per hundred feet, and since 1997 till now in 2015 to about 20 fish. So just in that short time span since 97, it's gone from 80 to 20 for every hundred feet. So you know, and they attribute it mainly to really you could put it to water loss that's what they say water levels because temperature is, is really impacted mainly by uh, trees and the quantity of water so just something to take note as we pursue that option um, be aware of and then the second item is just the water reuse california annual conference and maybe we uh, to get the early bird special it'd be great if you uh, if you could tell uh, Tracy tonight uh, at the end of the meeting or Emma uh, whether you plan to attend and if that's not possible if you, we need to be emailed by the end of the week otherwise we got to go forth and make plans and it, it, if we do it afterwards it, it does cost more so that's possible but we you know we know everybody's cost conscious so uh, and I will note if you arrow down just a little bit more they're trying to uh, move forward with kind of a, a little more orientation toward board members I know you're a very technical group, so you might like the, the more technical uh, agenda, but they're also trying to, uh, and, you know, focus on that. So I might find that of some of interest. Thank you. Okay. So I think that takes care of the <coughs> organization-wide status report. So if there's any, or did you have something to add? Or, no, if there's any, que any questions or comments from the public on the, any of those items, this would be the time. Thank you. Thank you for the good reports. Becky Steinbrunner from Aptos. I just um, really want to ask more about why the district is choosing to do the ammonia testing on the O'Neill Ranch well now when you're also doing the surface water transfer pilot testing. My understanding was the whole purpose of doing the surface water pilot testing was to test the um, effects on the groundwater levels and stream flows by not pumping in that service area and instead using water from Santa Cruz City's North Coast streams. And so I was very shocked to learn that the O'Neill Ranch was turned on. I had understood in the beginning of hearing a summary of this project, that the water transfer project, that during the, the life of the project from November through April, the O'Neill and the Main Street wells would be turned off in order to really test this. So I was shocked to hear the Santa Cruz City water report that the district turned the O'Neill Ranch on just barely two weeks after the water surface water transfer experiment began. Why? Why, why is this happening? Um, it, it reduced the flow from 1,200 gallons a minute, sometimes higher, that you were not pumping from the ground. It reduced it to uh, half. So you've increased your pumping from the groundwater to time when you're trying to find out if turning off the wells and using surface water would work. It, this makes no sense, and I have to tell you, the Water Supply Advisory Commission was shocked. And many people in the community who celebrated with you, Director Daniels, when the valve was opened, were shocked. 
So to me, even to hear not many questions coming from the board, thank you, uh, Director Christensen, for at least mentioning it. it. It seems like the whole focus is testing the ammonia at O'Neill. Why does that have to be done now? Why can't that wait until after um, April or whenever the wa surface water transfer agreement ends for this season? It's perplexing. And it's very, very disappointing, and I'd like an explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to comment on that. Go for it. So we're not testing to see whether surface water transfers will work or not. They will work. We're testing to, to see whether there's anything unanticipated by having it come into our, a part of our district will occur. So. Um, the purpose is not to see whether or not the district wells will recover because of surface water. We know that will work. The purpose is to see what the, whether there's any unanticipated effects of having surface water come into our district beyond the testing that we already did. We don't think there will be, but this is just a, another test to see if there's anything unanticipated. I was uh, sorry, no back and forth, no back and forth. Your comment period's done. Excuse me. Please be respectful. Yeah. So um, I don't remember it ever, ever, anything ever mentioning that the other wells would be turned off during the whole time of the winter transfer. Um, I think that we do want to utilize that transfer, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't honestly know what the flow rates of you know, our, what our planned flow through that, through the water transfer is gonna be related to those. The, the primary function is to see whether the pilot test would work and cause uh, in adverse in health impacts. It regar regarding how much we pump or take, that's a relative number. You pump more, you see, you know, certain impacts. You pump less, you see the same impacts and you can extrapolate. So it's, that's not really. Uh, but it was always meant to be mixed. That is what I understood. So is there anyone else that wishes and to address Becky, it? I will talk with you more about this later if you'd like to, because there's a misunderstanding here. Yeah. But it's, it's not appropriate at the, at the board level to right. take time on that. I do. I'm Monica McGuire, um, now in Coralitos, still working in Aptos. Um, to comment further on that, too, actually, because I am um, another person who would love further explanation. It doesn't make sense to those of us who were under the impression that the board and the district was not thinking that the water transfer system would work for refilling the aquifers, and that's why it wasn't, uh, one of the reasons it wasn't being done. And those of us who have done our best to keep asking, since it's so much less expensive, and one of the particular comments I wanted to make too is from what Mr. Duncan said, that the uh, lower numbers of fish are due to loss of water, and then he corrected himself and said to levels of water. My understanding is that, again, the water transfer system is superior for the fish habitat as well, because it takes water away from the excess water flow, such as we're having right now, which is also very detrimental to fish. Um, when there's too much water going out and all the water that is for all these years lost to the bay with the water runoff since water transfers haven't been done for all these years that they were suggested. And all of these years we could have been refilling the aquifer and offsetting the saltwater intrusion, et cetera. It's just, it, there's very often this strange discussion that defies some of the um, basic understanding that those of us who try to look at it have. So there's, okay. There's so many pieces to the water transfer not happening at the level that it was expected to in order to show how much it can refill the aquifer and offset at a fraction of the cost. And again, that's something I'm very upset to see still in the literature that there's what just went out with the Prop 218 protest information, which wasn't clear again and didn't show up in a way that helps the people who are paying the bills to understand that the cost of the water transfers is actually a fraction of the cost of the pure water um, titled program. So there are too many factors that affect all our children. 
that affect the existing residents who don't understand this massive increase in their rates ha coming to them now that they could be learning to protest, but there wasn't a easy understanding, and again, there was misinformation about the cost difference between the water transfers and the pure water proposed and all the problems with the EIR that we all put forth all our concerns and they were not answered in the incredibly short 10-day period that we could possibly have looked at it. So all of these things, I want to just again say this is worse than disconcerting and, and we really do need to keep trying to alert people to what the real choices are and they don't seem like they're coming from here honestly. Thank you. Thank you for your concern. And if I you want to meet with Becky and I after the meeting, I, we can talk about this. I wanted to just make a point: is that people keep saying it's a ask the people to sit down. Every, yeah. Sorry, we're done with that. Sorry, your comment is finished. Thank you. But the people keep mentioning the price of the water for this. This is a pilot test at a rate that is absolutely not going to continue beyond the current pilot test to see if it's working and safe for our customers to mix surface water with a groundwater system. Um, yeah, and, I, and we recently put it on an FAQ about cost because somebody did raise that concern. Do you want to just say it in a nutshell? Yeah, that was presented to the board on December 4th. It was a tech memo that was created um, in collaboration with the city of Santa Cruz on water rates that we would see uh, currently with the pilot project. They actually stated within their water commission meeting that that was uh, a discounted rate that wouldn't be used for a long-term contract and at this point because they are so early on in their proof of concept with their um, evaluation process they don't have cost estimates and they directed us on the studies to use that would uh, be the basis at this point for both the city and ourselves in looking at what long-term uh, river water transfer project cost would be uh, so you may want to note that, um, right. and I can direct that to you later, uh, Ms. McGuire, on the website. It's basically 15 times the cost of what they're charging us now, and we can talk later about it. Okay. So, anybody else? Well, right. I think the other thing Michelle. to mention is that, you know, for now it's only 300 acre feet, uh, so that's not going to fill up the basin or anything, and and that's only going to go this year and next year. So, um, you know, we. We don't even know where it's going to go from there. Um, we do not. Uh, we certainly know that you know, to go any higher than that's going to require a water rights change. And uh, you know, the first the city is starting an EIR on that. They have also have to do a habitat conservation plan (HCP), and then they have to go to the state board to ask for the water right change. And they currently have one that's been going on for 12 years. So I don't know how long it's going to take. I mean, I, I know the city thinks it's going to just take a short amount of time, but I don't know. So, Michelle. I, mm, I've been kind of like thinking about this thing about people scaring others about this huge increase in the rates. And I looked at my bill and I paid $1 a day per person in my household. That's how much I pay. And I doubt too many people pay more than that. And that's, if it goes to $1.10, is water worth it? I think so. I have a real problem with this whole scare tactic because it really isn't that much. Okay. okay. Let's move on. We're moving on now. That item is now finished. Um, there is no district council report. There is uh, 5.3 uh, Mid-County Groundwater Agency update. Yeah, nothing really to report there. The MGA has not met for a while at council. One meeting won't be right. uh, meeting again until February. There is a GSP advisory committee meeting, Groundwater Sustainability Plan Advisory Committee meeting next week, and uh, some additional modeling results will be uh, presented at that. It's one of the main focus and then some other discussions. That Those agendas will be published and right. put out. Okay. All right, so now we go to... I think that's what you're coming up for, yes. Item 6.1, conditional and unconditional will serve letters. Good evening again. Yeah, we have eight will serve letters to consider, for you to consider, and there will be um, another handful of them next meeting. Uh, this is a, a backlog of, of people on the wait list that have been uh, allowed to move forward with the uh, approval of the AMI fee to free up 
these will serve. So uh, I can answer any questions about any specific ones if you wish. Anyone? Okay, any, any, any members of the public on this item? Okay. Then we will This is not that item. Yeah. All right. So, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, I'll move to approve. I'll second it. Okay. So I'll move to approve the uh, board actions, which are th no, those will serve letters. Through seven, yeah. One through eight. eight. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Until the signs get up. Well, there's another thing. In fact, it's you can see it on the earlier things that we talked about. We are selling water that we don't have yet. We are, we're talking about you know, putting together the contracts for the AMI equipment. Then we have to <laughs> submit the, the purchase order for the AMI equipment. Then we have to get the equipment. Then we have to install the equipment. And then we also have to have the, you know, the electronic system to actually take the information on a daily basis and then contact the customer. So it'll probably be six months before we actually start saving any water at all, but we're selling them tonight. But there, I don't think yeah, any of these projects, projects will be constru constructed by then either. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I think we looked at that timing at the meeting when we first discussed this whole whole yeah. plan and Shelley Some of these over. people may already have their will, uh, permits. But they may have been on the old program. Yes, exactly. But the ones on the new ones, mm -hmm. those, those are people that are going to go forward um, you know, with starting something. Mm -hmm. They're just getting a conditional. There may be a few early, a few way late. I think it'll work, you know, to what we're trying to achieve, but it would be achievable. I think we'll have water savings in time for the actual use. All right, item 6.2, uh, Ron. Yeah, so this is an update on uh, the two uh, water supply projects that we're really focusing on, Pure Water Soquel and the river water transfer. We'll kick it off with Pure Water Soquel. And really what we wanted to do, and it's, it's for tourists, uh, it's, we're fortunate, was inform the board that uh, we now see the need to do additional outreach uh, beyond what we've done, which is quite a bit and will be presented, to uh, people around Chanticleer. We've been talking uh, that site, uh, around that site. We need to reach out more uh, to some of those people we've been prompted. So what we wanted to do was run the board through a, a, some of the uh, informational items that we hope to present to these people. And we actually have, I think, some people in the crowd tonight, so they'll see a little preview. And we hope to get some feedback from you either tonight or later. That'd be excellent about whether we're kind of addressing some of the some of the concerns anyway, at least on, getting on that track. So with that, I'll just let's just kick it off. And uh, uh, well, we're gonna let's save. Do we want to do the surface water first? Uh, let's let's. It's the quick one. It's the quick one. Okay. Do you you want to? I think we kind of talked about that, didn't we? G give a give a two minute or one two minute synopsis, if you would, please, Tosh. I I, I just I'm sure. Um, for these people out here. Yeah, I'm not sure if they're aware of what that is. We've been talking a little bit about it tonight, but um, the intent is to continue with purchasing some surface water from the city um, through the end of April. And um, we will, you know, as part of the recommendation all along to ease into the, um, the introduction of this water into our system. And so the fact that we ran O'Neill is actually a recommendation to blend in this water with our groundwater. And, um, you know, it was three weeks worth of, of uh, production dropped down from Roughly a thousand, twelve hundred to five hundred. So, we're we're back on track. It's it's not a big loss for the for this pilot uh, exploration. Um, closely working with the city, there's been relatively no uh, technical glitches with the inner tie infrastructure. Uh, it's remotely controlled and automated to turn on and off. Um, we one thing that will be coming is is uh, updates to you on the water quality that we have been um, collecting in the isolated area near Soquel and Capitola. In addition, we are starting uh, this next month to do lead and copper testing at customers' houses in Soquel uh, as part of our permit amendment. That's a requirement. So 
it's a little too early to really discuss that information. Really, I, I'm just here to say that logistically, we transferred 27 acre feet. Um, if if we hadn't turned on O'Neill, you know, maybe we'd be up to 45 or 40. Um, but it, you know, anticipated no, to be roughly around two, 200, 250 acre feet over the course of the transfer time period. And we'll just continue to keep you posted. I'm, I'm, we're, we're working with the city on, on this. I think we will ultimately continue the dialogue to understand the city's cost um, projections for after the, the pilot is over, hopefully next winter we can expand it to a bigger part of the distribution system. Um, but we'll keep you posted. It's a little too early to say that that's going to happen, but it should be able to happen. Okay, but the plan is to you know have two to 250 acre feet by the time we're done? By April of this April. coming year, yes. Okay. Great. We see that as um, Thank you. achievable. Great. And the, with, so this is in service area one. one. So the plan is to, there's it's, there's intertie between one and two? Correct. And so are we gonna decrease pumping where makes the most sense in those two ser service areas or, or right now we're just gonna decrease it in service area one? You mean like next winter? Or this winter, you know, just. Well this winter we're not gonna, um, we're, we're decreasing pumping in a subset of sub area one. Okay. And it's, it's uh, O'Neill, Garnet, and Main Street. Those and that's the to get the right blend to, te to test the. It's it's more just so that we don't overflow our tanks. Okay. Um, to maximize the amount of water that comes in. Right. There's a limit. There's a, well, it's the limit is our demand right. at this stage, um, and we could. Uh, it shuts. Uh, it runs for about six hours, the inner tie during okay. the day. So, okay. it's by far not constantly on. Um, next winter, we can, if we expand the, the service area, it will run probably longer mm -hmm. and we can transfer Assuming more of that water. Assuming that's a wet year and Santa Cruz is willing to give it to us. Oh, right. There's those conditions. Correct. Yeah. And then in terms of the, the testing, you're testing where the, where the surface water is entering the system, but I assume you're also testing other areas to see how it compares. Yes, within the isolated distribution system, there are sample stations, and we're taking samples from those, and then in addition to some additional new lead and copper houses okay. yeah, that qualify for that. Just in case there was some change, you want to rule out the possibility that there's some unusual change. In right. We, we knew going into this that the, um, uh, the source of the water has higher organics and so right. we are monitoring for total trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids. So we'll share those data with you when we get them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Can I ask a question? Thank you, Taj. Wait, I wanted to ask. Sure. Yeah. Um, have there been any calls about uh, difference in odor or, or taste? I know that in... Um, I'll yeah, let Christine in, handle that one. When I worked in San Francisco, sometimes when they get the surface, the surface water from a different source and the hedge edgy people would call and notice a difference we've received one complaint of a musty odor um, and we went to the home and tested the chlorine residual and it was it was perfect so um, that's the only one we've gotten okay, okay. thank you yeah, we have uh, four employees that are within this zone, so they're also are mm. uh, reporting, and I haven't heard anything. But I have some friends too. No, they couldn't tell. They Good. got the notice, but they didn't notice a difference. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Carry on. Yes. Great. Yeah. So the next part will focus uh, not on the uh, river transfers, but uh, pure water SoCal. And so what we wanted to do was present some of the uh, material that we want to try to use to inform, educate um, uh, some of the people around Santa Clara, because as Melanie will show, we did a fair amount of outreach, but as you, there are people here tonight and we've gotten a couple other, I think, uh, requests for information. So we wanted to show you what we thought we would present and get some feedback on that. So I'll just kick it right off. Um, 
with, uh, you know, you can't, it, it, it always behooves us to talk about the problem. And so we'll do that. Y'all have seen these slides a million times, but this does, this shows that the state of California designated our basin as critically overdrafted. It's 21 of out of over 500 basins. It's a serious scarlet letter badge on our basin and we have a serious problem. That's also demonstrated by the next slide that we'll, we would always have to share with people is that we have seawater intrusion. This is a map of Monterey Bay. The gold being showing seawater intrusion down toward the Monterey all the way to Highway 101 almost in Watsonville in three miles. That red band's ours. It's onshore in some spots and where it's not onshore already, it's right at the shoreline. So the clock is pending so that that urgency is there make you know we've had this peer reviewed and it's it's there's no doubt about that so where the, a lot of confusion i think everybody knows probably we have issues you know with uh water shortage and seawater pollution so what may not be well as well known is that and we want to share the information about uh in 2014 the state said your basin is in such issue you've got to uh, form a uh, uh, a GSA, a Groundwater Sustainability Agency, and get a plan done in two years and reach um, uh, sustainability in 2040, 2040 uh, and get on with it. Otherwise, we're going to come in and cut everybody back. So that I think setting that stage is important. And you can see the boundary. It actually, for the Mid-County Groundwater Basin, goes out to... Uh, I guess almost Highway 17 on the left side and down into almost Watsonville or Pajaro Valley on the right side and then inland a few miles. So it's the whole area that's considered uh, the basin, you know. So we're in this together is the hashtag we use. Now, in addition to that, this red area, I thought it was very important because I live in Live Oak and I see some of the, the, the chatter and concerns and, you know, it's all valid and we just haven't been able to communicate with these people is that if you live in Live Oak, you know, there are several wells in Live Oak down at the end of Roland Drive and if you're from that area and, and, and right at, they call them the Belts Wells. In the Belts Wells, in Live Oak, Santa Cruz pumps water and they pump equivalent to provide about half the water to Live Oak. So Live Oak is, is you know, needs the restoration of the basin together. Uh, and I think this is important for Santa Clara, uh, people around Santa Clara and Live Oak, because what they're thinking, what we're hearing is, hey, this is to help you, not us. Does it have any role? You know, how does it have any role with us? So we wanted to show that, and this shows, I think, some of the wells that Santa Cruz has. But next, sli next slide. And so getting that across, I think it's very important that, uh, yeah, a, a facility there uh, does provide value in, in, uh, in helping restore the base in which they partially rely on also. So that, that's, that's kind of the problem statement and that thing a part about Live Oak is essentially using, uh, you know, aquifer water also. And then Melanie was going to uh, bring up the community water plan and some other things that we'll run through real quickly. I think it's important to know whenever we do talk about the problem that the problem isn't just so Cut Creek Water District's problem. It is the whole mid-county area and that one graphic that we showed earlier which had all of those dots. Um, there are a lot of straws in our groundwater basin. So whether you're a private well owner, a mutual, you get your water through a mutual system or one of the four municipalities that are served through that groundwater basin, we are now mandated to be responsible. Um, in bringing that to sustainability. Specifically for the Soquel Creek Water District. Oh, what happened there? No, we jumped, uh, you hit the button, I think. You tapped it. Oh, I think my belly hit it. Yeah, I think belly hit it. <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> Christmas. Um, for Soquel Creek Water District specifically, um, the way that our agency is uh, going forward with our road path to water sustainability was um, done through a community process, a really based and formed out of environmental stewardship of protecting the health of the groundwater basin and of course uh, led by the scientific data that we collect and the modeling and, and data has kind of driven the solutions. Um, w in polling the community, we had three core values that we kind of base as our tenants. That's water reliability, high water quality, and timeliness to get the project done so that further seawater intrusion doesn't go forward. Um, I think this has 
been a constant message today, and it, it continues to be as we go forward with our outreach, is that the solution for basin sustainability is m likely a multiple, uh, multiple projects, not just one. So we do look at this as an and, not or. In terms of the community water plan facets, um, of course, we do uh, prioritize water conservation, also about groundwater management. Uh, managing the pumping and where we're pumping from. And then of course it is exploring and securing supplemental water supplies. The board of directors in 2015 identified the, uh, a multiple uh, types of projects for us to evaluate, recycled water projects, which is that green, uh, green icon. Um, water transfers with the city of Santa Cruz, exploring desalination with a project down in Moss Landing, and of course stormwater capture, which would be small projects. Uh, I'm going to control it because it's showing up funny down here. Oh, okay. Does that Thank help? Thank you. Next slide. Okay. Uh, yeah. You've done a great job considering the distractions. <laughs> well, we want to get it right for the television. There's an there's issue here. So. So specifically, we're going to delve into the Pure Water Soak Hell project. Of those four projects that I just went through, the Pure Water Soak Hell project is the project that the Soquel Creek Water District Board took as the lead agency to further evaluate. The Pure Water Soak Hell project is a project that is aimed to reduce uh, beneficial I'm sorry, reduce ocean discharge currently about 8 million gallons a day of treated secondary effluent from the Santa Cruz Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant goes out to the ocean. This is a sample of the water. So the wastewater that gets collected through all of the f toilet flushing, um, laundry, showers from Aptos, La Selva Beach area, Santa Cruz, gets treated at the regional facility to secondary standards, and that's that bottle right there, and then that water goes out to the bay. The Pure Water Soak Help Project would take that water and purify that um, to a standard that then would be suitable and could meet regulations to go back into the groundwater basin and be used to recharge the basin and um, create a seawater barrier. And Melly, I might add, I know it was uh, big early on, uh, the secondary water, that would be the, the least grade quality w we would achieve, would hopefully get tertiary or beyond if it's at this facility. But uh, this is it. This is the secondary water that goes out to the ocean and it has no odor to it or no, no you know, it smells musty. So like I think our groundwater said earlier. So just in case, because that's always a big issue, that and lighting and traffic. So I just put that out there. Next slide. So we have been evaluating this project since 2015. We've done a feasibility study. We've done the environmental review. And um, this slide here just illustrates the environmental review process that was conducted over the last two years and the notification and outreach that went through this because uh, based upon the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, the creation of a draft and final environmental impact report has a very public process. So uh, we did notify um, residents and businesses along the corridor of the project vicinity with postcards that illustrates over 7,500 postcards were sent out. We had multiple press releases, websites, email blasts, um, newspaper articles. We did um, really promote the project through Facebook and Nextdoor. We had um, three public meetings, and we also, what's not on that that I did want to share is we did hang signs at, at every site location that was being under evaluation. And, and we met with, you know, people right around adjacent to the facility. So, you know, one of the things we hear, and it's common because until, until somebody, until something happens, it's usually too many people have too much on their plate, but the point is that you know, in the vicinity of that, we reached out along the corridors and at each potential site. So, uh, but there's more work that needs to be done, obviously. Um, there's a lot of questions typically that people ask us when we talk about a purification facility and what does it look like and how big is it. This is a facility that Director Lather, myself, and a staff member from the city of Santa Cruz toured. It was a Pure Water San Diego facility. Um, that demonstration facility is basically about the size of our full scale plan. It, that facility there treats about 1 million gallons per day. And as you can see in terms of the, the size of the racks right behind us are reverse osmosis membranes. 
that's about the size that we're looking at for the Pier Water SoCal project. So, Melanie, to get perspective relative to this room, would you say it's about the size of this room, twice, one half? I mean, what is it? Maybe three times this size. Yeah. And so this is the information we think is useful, and we, again, we want some feedback. So this this is some of the slides that we've been presenting, and we're going to go out farther um, as we go forward. But in terms of the direction from the board on December 18th, um, with the project being designed now to go forward with design and permitting, what we're looking at is splitting the treatment process to um, be a twofold, um, where we would have tertiary treatment at the city of Santa Cruz and a purification facility that would be a satellite. The board has prioritized us to look at Shanna Clear in addition to continue explore exploring the whole purification facility at Santa Cruz. Can I, can I interrupt for a second? Mm -hmm. So tertiary treatment, correct me if I'm wrong, is acceptable for irrigation of organic crops? Organic crops and, uh, you know, football f athletic fields at, at schools, schools, schools whatever okay. parks yeah and that's what's commonly used Scotts Valley uses that Pajaro is doing some of that for their organic crops and I think conventional too okay but um, yeah that's a great question so the plan would be to do that first step of treatment um, which would be that tertiary level of treatment at the city of Santa Cruz that is a footprint currently um, identified as the site where that tertiary treatment would take place the site there currently has in the top corner of that an existing tertiary facility that would we would replace with a membrane tertiary treatment. The benefit that, doc, that Director Jaffe had mentioned is that once that water is treated to a tertiary level, then that where that water is conveyed anywhere along that pipeline, it could be used in the future if desired to irrigate along the way, schools, parks, golf courses, or landscaping. Where, where we're exploring right now is the um, prioritized um, purification facility is at the Shanna Clear site. This is kind of a vicinity bird's eye view of the layout. Currently, uh, we are looking at the yellow box area, which um, is where the Pure Water Soquel purification facility would go. That blue strip is where um, the Regional Transportation Commission and the County of Santa Cruz have identified um, as a bike pedestrian overcrossing. And then also in this image is um, a red outline, which is where the proposed medical building is being explored for Kaiser. What we've realized in the last uh, month or so with um, Kaiser also coming out and, and talking about that proposal is that a lot of people are confused, calling us and, and saying, oh, your projects are going to be, you know, competing, and, and no, they are not. We are working with Kaiser representatives. Um, they are aware of our project. We're aware of theirs. Um, and um, at this point, what, what we're trying to explain to people is that these projects are not in conflict. As I mentioned in that last slide, that blue bar in the front of the Chanticleer property that we're exploring is a bike pedestrian overcrossing. These are images from the Regional Transportation Commission that shows a before and after that overcrossing um, is, is, would be built there. And, and so on the bottom figure where it comes down on the right, that's along uh, Soquel in front of the Shanna Clara site, right? So there's this declining ramp that kind of takes away from store frontage or any, that's one of the reasons we thought this site was good because it'd be, you couldn't put stores there with this kind of ramp coming down. Um, yeah, and this, this was just approved in, a, I think, a 10 to 12 year EIR that they did, the RTC, just like a week ago. Yeah, this um, County of Santa Cruz and the RTC have um, contracted with a design team who is bringing that that overcrossing to 100% design. There it is in another, there, here's the Santa Clara lot, uh, Soquel, uh, the glass place uh, there, and then here's the bike. Uh, so it's crossing the highway. It yes. does, it comes over, there's a dead end, it comes, it comes on from the other side of Highway 1, 
comes up because remember you got people it's hard to pedal up high or if you want uh, a, if you're in a wheelchair you want the slope to be ADA compliant so it takes a lot of length mm -hmm. to get what you need here and it's very important to have that um, I've been in a wheelchair and it's hard to get up hills you know you got to get that ramp high Ron before you move off of that slide I think one other thing that we want to make sure that we convey to um, the local residents and business owners in that area they, they are aware that as part of our process that the district did when we were looking at siting a purification facility was exploring additional sites and that well, uh, there was a site that is and still on the table is the West Annex site at the SoCal Creek Water District's vicinity right next door to us. And um, in exploring additional sites to consider in the EAIR, we identified this property at Chanticleer with um, the county uh, giving us available uh, lots in the area as a potential site for the purification facility because of that bike ped overcrossing. It was considered not a, a, a great site because of the blockage on the frontage road and in terms of meeting our needs and the, the traffic that would be very minimal for us to be a site that we could into the EIR. So here's the main footprint of the building and these are some other yes, I have a slide on that. Okay, great. Thank mm -hmm. you. So the, these are additional slides that are in the EIR. These are our renderings. This is an existing view. As you know right now this site is pretty much vacant except for um, um, an abandoned like barn building. Um, it is used for parking and some storage. I think that the businesses in that area rent that site out currently. This slide that um, Ron just went to is a conceptual layout of what the facility could look like once it was completely built. The landscaping that is shown there at this time um, is shown there. However, if the bridge goes, uh, the bridge goes first, then that would be the bridge. This is more. Oh, this one. Yeah. I did want to, I have some s more details on this because we have been getting, you know, I think this is great. We've been getting a lot of calls. I did go to a constituent meeting for the first district and got some um, questions that uh, public members are asking and we're building into the slide deck. But in terms of the layout and what it would look like here at, um, at the Chanticleer site, the typical height of the buildings are anywhere between 12 and 30 feet in height. Um, there would be um, a, the fully developed footprint is about 65,000 square feet. If you only looked at the buildings and the parking and the facility themselves, it's just over 15,000 square feet. Um, currently, this area is zoned as M1 light industrial. And um, through the environmental impact analysis um, and identifying what those impacts would be, there would be no noise or odor impacts. There would be no impacts really related to traffic. The only significant and unavoidable impact would be noise during construction. Once the facility is in operation, there are no significant impacts uh, at that site. The daily traffic impacts for operations of a purification facility would be, you know, the, the coming and going of about five to six employees. Plus, we have identified for the purification facility that we would have youth and educational tours. So we do have a lot of schools that do trips to all of our facilities, and we would add this purification facility to our list of sites that schools can tour. I'd like to see a water fountain there at the end of the bike ramp, too, since I'm a cyclist and water is <laughs> always worth. Um, with, with the project approved and moving into design and permitting, we will be looking at concepts to make sure that the facility fits uh, within the neighborhood. Um, these are just kind of, you know, what if we have not gotten to this point in the project design. But these are s facilities that are in current operations that are uh, water facilities. This is a reverse osmosis desalter facility in Pleasanton at the right. I mean, at the top, the bottom one is a recycled water facility in Washington, um, and the bottom one as well. These are some other sites. I do like that one on the top left. It's an office building in, in Capitola. And then um, the bottom left one is actually the Live Oak Business Park, which houses the county sheriff's department and some other um, 
the county facilities. The message here, I think, is when we, when we talk to con uh, you know Shana, people around Shanna Claire and Live Oak, is that this building can reflect what what they would like to see and incorporate uh, some of those attributes. So uh, that's the main thing. There's no set thing. Um. You know, there's always a lot of questions related to what, what kind of treatment is going to happen there. Um, is the water safe? Again, going back to that picture of the Pure Water San Diego, those were the reverse osmosis membranes. But really, once that water gets to a tertiary level treatment, the purification process includes microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and ultraviolet light. All of these are in a self contained system. So, again, you know, there really is. Um, no odor, no noise. Um, this is the purification process that would create a water that is purer than most bottled water, higher quality than the existing treated surface water and groundwater that um, agencies uh, produce. Yeah, they, you know, I think people deserve to see at least one slide on the technology and then, you know, relating that back to something like, you know, if you've been to Orange County or Disneyland in the last 35 years, you, you drink in this water and you, the plant, and actually their, their facility is right next to a neighborhood, uh, the Orange County one is, and there's a park nearby and maybe even a school, I'm not sure. But they, they, I asked them, they said no issues, no issues with any of that. This is a bottle from the Orange County facility that um, we got from uh, them. They are passing this out just for education and outreach. Ron actually went and spoke to a group today and brought a bottled water. And it's good for people to see and to show. So they have a great relationship with water agencies, and we will be getting more of these as our other um, agencies that are looking at it. We likely will be getting water from the Pure Water Monterey project when it comes online. There is a project just about 40 miles from us that is already um, up about two to three years ahead of us, but they are also online to do the exact same thing. It's for um, purified water for groundwater replenishment. The, the whole purpose being third, you know, independent oversight to further demonstrate the, the quality of the water. That's always a question people have, and it's of you know, great quality. I, do you want me to talk on that one or no? Uh, Any more? You mean this one? I hadn't talked on. Oh, I thought you just did. Uh-uh. Oh. I talked about Orange County. Okay, go for it. Just um, this, I, I like to show this because I think this is, is an important slide. In 2016, um, the board did ask us to commission the National Water Research Institute to have a, an advisory panel to evaluate the water quality um, and the removal of constituents of emerging concern and that that water would be safe. And so uh, we had um, regulators, professionals in toxicology and um, groundwater replenishment and academics come and sit at a panel. And this was an article that came out from the uh, Santa Cruz Sentinel that gave the, the project basically what they called the headline was a thumbs up, that the project could be protective of health and provide reliable water. And then this slide we actually did, it was, um, a, you know, we are actively looking at grants and low interest loans. This was a criteria that um, um, was one of the, um, I think, requirements of the federal grant. But it, it has provided also a lot of the outreach and uh, information for our local community. Just in terms of the project, the Pure Water Soquel project, uh, would provide a b over $900 million in economic benefits. And when looking at whether or not we develop the project or not develop a project, it, it does protect and preserve jobs and housing for our area. And also when you look at the alternative of doing a project or no project, it's about uh, a, a threefold if yeah. the cost of not doing a project. So, you know, we're one community, there's, there's big benefits. I don't even think that included necessarily all of the, the live oak impacts. So I think um, I think I'm, I'm at the last slide, but or two, uh, just in terms of a cost. I think that's always important. You know, how much is the project? We um, the project was estimated when we did our 2017 feasibility study to be 70 million dollars. Um, when you look at a project cost, or you look at anything in terms of inflation, the further out you go 
food, gas, water, a big, large water supply project, those project costs go up. So when you project out to what we're looking at when we're designing, constructing, and putting this project online, we do see that the project would cost about $90 million. Um, one of the ways, again, that we're looking at reducing the project cost, both for our ratepayers, but also just, you know, locally and for the region, um, we're looking at grants. And so we're very fortunate that we did secure over $2 million already in planning and feasibility. And we've been invited back to apply for a grant under the Prop 1 groundwater grant, specifically for seawater intrusion. And that grant has um, is up to $50 million. So if we're awarded that, um, we are looking at reducing the project cost by half. The Pure Water SoCal timeline is, as you know, we started this effort in 2015, and we are now looking in kind of being in the space of permitting and design and hopes of bringing the project online in 2022 to meet the, and, and achieve the goal of the state, which has mandated us that the basin be sustainable by 2040. Yeah, I mean, if we don't stop the, this uh, saltwater pollution, then costs all all water is going to go up Santa Cruz ours this last slide I just really like this uh, you know in terms of education outreach and continual messaging um, you know it really is all about groundwater protection these are some some signs or or messages for locally as well as across the US the mid county groundwater agency says groundwater is a vital resource together let's protect it the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency had this on their Facebook page just last week. Groundwater sustainability is all our responsibility. Um, be part of the solution, not part of the pollution. That was something in Texas. And again, another one is entering groundwater protection zone. Please protect our drinking water source. I, I really like that. So I, you know, what we want to do is go into the community over there and and listen you know show them what we have but really listen and take back and modify things uh bring back to the board so that's it on the shanna clara site and i know some people are probably anxious to talk and we hope before you leave today you'll give us some contact information so we can reach back out to you if you want to do one-on-one -on -one or whatever we meet in kitchens we meet in every style you you can imagine uh I want to add to the second part of that, though, it's not just about Santa Clara, as the board directed, co-look at down in Santa Cruz and, and having the whole facility down there. So uh, we, we, we've been doing that. We've set up meetings uh, for Friday. We have uh, the, the right players in there for that. We were on a conference call today. I know uh, various people have been meeting with each other, trying to explore that. Um, not really ready to discuss much of what's coming out of that, but we are following that route as you directed us to see about the feasibility of the entire facility uh, being down there. So more to update on that later. We just, you know, feedback. I don't know if you want the public to speak, but feedback on well, in this information. Well, yeah. Of course. Bruce, do you want to? And just quickly, I th thought there were some people that didn't know or were confused at the place that this water would end up and uh, I think oh, that might be a good to mention that great okay. you know what um, thank you director Daniels also on the back of the uh, room here we have two poster boards one is a map of the Santa Cruz groundwater uh, basin um, the one on the right which shows where all of our wells are and uh, where the seawater intrusion is being detected the one directly underneath the clock does have the complete project overview. And once the water is purified, it would go out to recharge and seawater intrusion prevention wells. The three wells that our hydrologist has identified as being the, the best locations to ensure that we could replenish specific units of our aquifer um, are located more in the mid-county mid so Kel Aptos area, Capitola. So we have um, cited in our EIR, we've identified a well um, in Mon uh, Monterey Avenue in Capitola and Cambrio College Drive on and on Willowbrook Drive. So those would be the three recharge locations that that purified water would go into. Thank you. Yeah, you know, r really what it boils down to is that it's a it's kind of a regional facility that's, that is housed somewhere that's serving a lot of people, much like the wastewater treatment plant. It's down in Santa Cruz, but it's serving the entire county, right, and the city. So this while it's helping 
Mid County, it's helping Live Oak. So it's again that kind of philosophy. But you know, we need to engage with the people in that in that neighborhood. And so that's that's our you know, that's where we're headed. Right. I mean, I'd like to have some things I'd like to expand on later, too, but I want to make sure I get people a chance to, to speak. So um, this would be a time if anybody wants to speak on this item. So please come to the podium and try and limit your comments to three minutes, our usual time. Hello, my name is Christine Walls. I'm a Live Oak resident. Sounds really cool. Seems like SoCal would want that in their neighborhood. Okay, um, get my reading glasses on. It seems like that we have, I have comments from um, a neighborhood in Live Oak, from a number of neighbors. Um, the SoCal Water District's attempt to place their wastewater treatment facility in the community of Live Oak is a classic case of not in my backyard, as well as um, a case of environmental just injustice. The SoCal Village community, a relatively affluent community with a medium <coughs> household income above that of Santa Cruz County, has protested against what sounds like a cool development to, of their water district's new water treatment plant in their own community. <clears throat> Instead, proposing that the plant that benefits them be constructed in Live Oak, a lower income community with a high proportion of minority residents, none of whom are served by the SoCal Water Creek, the SoCal Creek Water District. <clears throat> we, a few residents of the Live Oak, are against the SoCal Creek Water District placing their wastewater treatment plant in our neighborhood for the following reasons. First and foremost, the Live Oak community will not benefit from the water treatment plant, um, yet creation of such a plant in Live Oak will have a negative impact in the community, economically, environmentally, and socially, as well as potentially having negative health and safety impacts on Live Oak residents. There was no Live Oak res representation in the proposal or consideration of this project. There was no outreach spe um, specifically to Live Oak residents regarding the proposal of an out-of-district wastewater treatment plant on Chanticleer. Um, according to the EIR, numerous hazardous chemicals will be stored on site in quantities of up to 5,000 gallons. Construction of the plant on Chanticleer site would require up to 112, 112 daily truck trips to the site, heavily impacting traffic and emissions in the area, compared with a maximum of 24 truck trips to the headquarters west annex in Soquel. Plant construction would decrease air quality, increase, increase ambient noise for Live Oak residents. Uh, plant, plant operations would increase amb, um, ambient noise and nocturnal ambient light for Live Oak residents. A Soquel Creek Water District wastewater treatment plant on Chanticleer lot is not in the interest of Santa Cruz County from an economic development standpoint. This lot could be used in ways that directly benefit Live Oak residents. Um, economically and socially disenfranchised community. For example, the lot could be used for a park, a local business that provides jobs and tax revenue, medical offices or other community resources that support and benefit Live Oak residents. Um, historically in the U.S., communities have comprised of economically dis disadvantaged people and people of color have been forced to shoulder a disproportionate burden of society's industrial facilities, waste and hazardous chemical storage sites. Since the SoCal Creek Water District approved this project, they should develop the wastewater treatment plant on a site within their district. Sounds like a cool site with school tours. It seems like it should probably be in SoCal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else? First of all, I'd just like to reiterate what she just said. That was amazing. Um, I didn't plan this much because I'm kind of broad. Um, blindsided by this project. I guess, first of all, uh, my name is Ian Dixon. I live on Chanticleer. I'm one of these people. Um, and I'm here uh, basically as this, I just heard about this project recently. I never received any information about this. I feel blindsided about it. And it's like what she said. I don't understand why I'm at a uh, meeting for a water district that I'm not in, that it's, but it's something that is affecting me. I don't I should even be here. Um, I think a big issue on that using that land is the lost cost. What else could be there besides an industrial zone? I mean, I, um, I work at the elementary school. I'm the president of the home and school club there. I'm very um, integrated into the community and those people that, these people that live around there. And I don't know anybody who has seen, who wants that to continue be an industrial area. We would all rather see that be more to our commercial zone. Uh, we got Staples right on one side. We're going to have probably Kaiser Permanente down there. It's going to be an entrance from the pedestrian zone. I don't think the first thing I want people seeing when they come into my neighborhood is a water treatment facility as they bicycle over here. Um, oh, it's 
uh, I, the, the, my biggest point, and I, I just don't understand this, is it's not in my wa this is not my water district. I don't understand why this is going right next in my neighborhood. I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, if we could avoid applause and just let people speak, and and we're, we don't yield time to anybody else. Each person can have three minutes, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stacy Kyle. I'm a city of Capitola resident, um, but I'm in the Live Oak School District. So both of my children go to Live Oak School, which is the only California distinguished school in the county. Many people don't know that. Um, I acknowledge the need. I thought your presentation was very thorough. First time I've seen it, first time I've heard Thank of it. You. Um, and I acknowledge the need for the project. I question the location. Um, I'm concerned about the process and the lack of communication and outreach to our families. And we, as you can, we've lost some parents that were here earlier. But we're, um, we're very sensitive until in Live Oak that there are projects that more affluent communities don't want in their backyard that come to Live Oak. And so definitely outreach would be appreciated. Education, I work for the school district. That is a challenge for all of us to get to the community. Um, and I have some tips okay. when you do that on how to better do that because like, uh, like Ian, I also am pretty in involved and in, this was the first I heard of it was at a meeting last week. Um, Real estate in Live Oak is at a premium, and while this looks uh, good to serve everyone in the, in the county, as Live Oak residents, we need to be really thoughtful about what will benefit us because we don't have a lot of land to spare, and we have a lot of need. Um, so I think that's my, my main concern, is being very thoughtful about what goes there. That could be appropriate for light indi industrial, and, um, and will best serve our community right in Live Oak. We're very small, so we kind of, I, um, it's, it's a balance between what will serve us and what serves the larger, greater good, but I know Soquel residents had the chance to, Soquel Creek, uh, Soquel Creek Water District residents had an opportunity to support this project and didn't, and now it's landed in our backyard, so, um, so I appreciate further conversations. Thank you, and you have my card, right? I do. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Thank you. Hello, my name is Jenny. Um, my daughter goes to Live Oak, like some of the other parents, and I found out about this prog uh, project from them again last week. I do agree with much of what everybody else has said, and with regards to the outreach, um, none of this information has been in Spanish, which is a concern okay. for me. Um, a lot of the parents at Live Oak are Spanish speaking, and I would just like to see the information you give in the future presentations when you go speak with these people in Live Oak, that some of it be in Spanish, some of the flyers, presentations, whatever it may be, maybe a translator even, would be very helpful so they can um, get the equal amount of information as well. Great, thank you, good point, thank you. Thank you. My name is Gage Dayton. I'm a Live Oak resident as well, and I appreciate the, the presentation. I learned a lot, and, and my notes are, many of them are scratched off now. That said, I have a lot of questions similar to what's been said earlier. Um, so I, as I am a Live Oak resident, um, I'm here to speak against placing the advanced water treatment uh, facility uh, for the pure SoCal, SoCal water project at the Shannon Clear site. I don't think it's appropriate site. And I don't think there's been clear communication, and I don't think there's been good outreach to our community. I do not live directly adjacent to the site, um, but I do live in Live Oak. I follow and participate in regional and local planning efforts, but put more of my focus and energy into my community, Live Oak. Thus, while I was aware of the Pure Water Project and the very real problem uh, the SoCal Groundwater Basin faces, I had no idea that the potential sites for the facility was in Live Oak until the day before yesterday, I think. Um, and that, that's a concern. So I appreciate the outreach effort that will be made, mm -hmm. but I question why this site isn't going on um, district-owned property adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. um, Live Oak, as other people have mentioned, Live Oak uh, has very few remaining opportunities for ec economic rec and recreational development. We, we are a community where those are going away very quickly, and so they're an important resource. Um, and there's just simply not that many left for us. Uh, using one of the prime remaining locations Live Oak has for these kind of development or recreational opportunities, 
um, for a facility for SoCal, while I understand the regional um, impact, it is largely for SoCal. Um, it will rob us, it will have short-term impacts, and I think the EIR has addressed some of those yes. that are greater at the Chanticleer site than at the West Annex site. But it will rob us of future long-term opportunities um, for the rest of our lives, and, and that's a big deal. And those are opportunities that would um, better meet our community's needs and desires and provide an economic boost uh, to one of the more economically challenged neighborhoods in our area. And, and I believe the SoCal Creek Water District um, purchased, the, I think, the West Annex property. Is that correct? Is that yes. owned? And it's adjacent to the SoCal. So that seems like a much better place to me. Um, I understand the concern from the SoCal community who voiced their opposition to locating the treatment plant in their backyard. Um, we don't want it in ours either. Um, and this is the first opportunity you're hearing from a lot of Live Oak people because we just haven't heard about it. And, and um, so clearly, again, I think the outreach hasn't been impact or, or accomplished its goal. And I think that's a big deal in the EIR as well. So uh, while it hasn't um, reached us, I urge you to you know, continue with this discussion and the board to seriously consider not putting the plant at Chanticleer and re maybe even reconsidering the West Annex site. It seems like from a naive perspective, just looking at it at the 10,000 foot level, that seems like the appropriate site. And I'm not clear why that site wasn't chosen. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Nancy Stucker, and I live in SoCal. And I would like to voice my agreement with all the points made in the email from Marcia Noren <coughs> to Supervisor John Leopold that were included in the board document, um, item 7.1. And um, I believe that all the points that she makes are valid, and I support the board's resolution to not prioritize project development and siting at the West Annex site. Um, Supervisor Leopold talks about good urban planning, and um, I believe that good urban planning involves respecting residential zoning and not locating the treatment plant in a high density residentially zoned neighborhood where it would be surrounded on all four sides by homes. So um, uh, in addition, the land that the district has purchased at the West Annex site is on Capitola Avenue, and it is located within the boundaries of the SoCal Village Plan, and does not, which does not align um, with the vision of a water treatment plant, nor does the general plan for this particular parcel. So I'm hopeful that you'll continue to pursue non-residentially zoned sites for the Pure Water SoCal project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jane Paradise, and I live on Rosedale Avenue right next to the West Annex site. And I really appreciate hearing from all the Chanticleer residents uh, tonight because uh, we, in our neighborhood, um, are go went through what they're going through two and a half, three years ago when we found out that the West Annex site, which is residentially zoned, um, that the district was planning on using that for their uh, water treatment recycling facility. And we are, um, we, hundreds of uh, residences over the, uh, of the, the district, we worked hard with the district to find different locations. There were 24 other sites and uh, narrowed it down to 12. And we, um, we, we wrote letters uh, saying to the board that the so South Rodeo Gulch Road, which is embedded within an industrial park right next to Highway 1, was a very appropriate location for this type of project. And, uh, and we never found out why that wasn't chosen. Um, instead, um, there was a committee formed and a couple of board members were on it. I think Carla and Rachel were on it. And they decided to put Chanticleer on instead. 
um, but that was not, we were not, um, to say that we're being, we were being NIMBY through this process is, you know, for anyone who knows the history, including the board members, to say that we're being NIMBY about this is really not, um, it's unconscionable, really, to try to represent our neighborhood. Um, it's, um, this West Annex site is, uh, has residences zoned on for all four sides. People share fences <laughs> that were right next to it, including up on the hill. Um, and so the SoCal Village plan, um, it, so anything that goes there at that location is violating the SoCal Village plan and the general plan which the district is not exempt from, and the EIR, the final EIR, supports these findings, um, and I appreciate those board members that have um, been open and now understand the importance of why these uh, zoning um, and appropriately locating these uh, types of facilities. So again, I appreciate everyone communicating and I look forward towards the district continuing to educate not only these shanties, because I keep asking that, but I didn't hear the board really giving them the context um, of the, that um, it's not only how it's zoned, but the actual context. And I'm- Thank you. Yes, and I'm welcome um, to give you the zoning requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of the community of Aptos. Um, I also have a protest letter. What I gave on the staff before was actually a letter asking you to reconsider and rescind your decision to approve resolutions um, 1830 and 1831. For those of the um, Chanticleer people and anybody else listening, I really encourage you to go to the waterforsantacruz.com website and really find out that uh, there are options to this project. There are options that don't divide the community like what this project is doing here tonight. And it um, does not present health problems to the community. It does not take massive amounts of energy for reverse osmosis. I want to uh, have you clarify, please, for the Chanticleer people that uh, these reverse osmosis pumps would be in vaults, as has been said, but uh, that needs to clar be clarified because having visited the Zenker site in San Jose, those RO pumps are very, very noisy. I want to ask you to completely rescind the decision that you made approving the project and certifying as complete the EIR. And here are my reasons. There was new information presented at the meeting. One was by Director Lather that she has knowledge of asbestos in the area. She had great concerns about uh, well, that's what you said. Don't laugh. That's what you said. No, I'm laughing and because I didn't also, know. well, you can clarify, but let me have my time. Um, you also talked about your concerns of the historic use of the property and potential contamination. That was new information. Supervisor Leopold also came and said that he does not support the use of the Chanticleer site. That's new information because he also brought up the Kaiser Medical Facility. That's new information. Under the Vineyard Area Citizens for Responsible Growth versus the City of Cordova, new information must be uh, av available to be commented on by the public. So your board needs to at least give the public a chance to comment on the new pr information that was presented. You can shake your head no, it's all right. Um, I'm trying to really drive home here and, and I'm seeing a meeting with a wall. And, I, and this is matching what you, how you regarded the water transfers earlier. John Laird talked about regional cooperation, conjunctive use. You don't have to do this project. 
the city of Santa Cruz. Thank you. The city of Santa Cruz is willing to work with you. You just have to Thank be willing you. to work with them and the public. Thank you so much. And I'm Monica McGuire again, um, coming to say, add on what Becky was just saying, because it is absolutely not a good reason that you've each given me, that I've heard from Mr. Duncan as well, that the supposed reason for not doing the regional water transfers and the regional work is that you don't trust Santa Cruz City. That is not a good reason. Mediation and plenty of other opportunities exist to save the extreme costs of the pure water, which again is unnecessarily dividing the um, community here. Um, Ms. Lather, you also misspoke, again, more misinformation as I saw throughout this presentation when you said that your water bill was gonna go from a dollar to a dollar 10. N again, not counting the 24% pr uh, rate increases recently, there will be a 9% increase per year for five years. So how you can say it's gonna go from a dollar to a dollar 10 and think that you're correcting the record makes no sense to anyone with basic math skills. There's so much that, again, it's never been addressed that you, again, tried to highlight that you did these community outreach meetings, which I went to, and they were as negative as this experience, where there's three minutes to speak and supposedly no crosstalk. The, 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 this doesn't qualify as a community way of discussing or outreach, and those meetings did not either. And the overall, that the water transfer system could have been used years ago, as much as a decade ago, in order to refill the aquifer, that's terrible mismanagement. And most people understand that if they finally get to hear it, but you keep misrepresenting the facts to make it look as though you didn't have that option. And again, you're shaking your head, but we don't get any response with our concerns that we raise and ask about why on earth you're still not letting the water transfer pilot project at least continue in order to show how much that can do and to take all the necessary human, uh, what we would expect of a board of directors, human capable steps to go and speak with the other people in a way that anyone else can do in 2019. It isn't a good representation, what you're putting out, and that is so frustrating. And it's unnecessary expense and dividing the community while counting on the, f it seems counting on the fact that people are not stepping forward because they're so over busy with their lives. Waiting is the only prudent thing to do waiting until you see how well the water transfers could negate the need, could. I don't know it can for sure, and we won't mind paying for an extreme expense cost of the what you call pure water system if it's true that water transfers can't handle it. Thank you. Offer still there to talk after the meeting. I think it's really important to take seriously the comments of the people from Soquel, Becky Steinbrunner, Monica McGuire, and um, I, I can't help but thinking of this book that puts in a framework of what we're hearing tonight. It's called Toxic Sludge is Good for You lies, damn lies, and the public relations industry. And I think, uh, hmm, toxic poop water is good for you. Lies, damn lies, and the public relations industry. There's no way you can get the pharmaceuticals out of these, um, no matter how much you do in treatment. There are other options. There are some quotes in this book that stayed in my mind. One is from St Alex Carey, was his name, not the actor. And he said, the 20th century has been characterized by three developments of great political importance. The growth of democracy, the growth of corporate power, and the growth of corporate propaganda as a means of protecting corporate power against democracy. 
one of these corporate propaganda firms and they work hand in hand with the corporations uh, selling us products or forcing these products on the community. This at the time was Burst and Mars Teller and they said, the role of our communication is to manage perceptions which motivates behavior to create business results. So the perception being presented here is that this is a wonderful project. It's gonna solve all the problems and it's flawless. Well, remember how we told D we were told DDT is good for us, asbestos is great, leaded gasoline. How many times have we been manipulated into thinking that toxic chemicals are good for us? This is not a good project in terms of the well-being of the community or the quality of the water which we're talking about defending. I feel like this is huge corporate propaganda and at one of your workshops, you had a slide that I want a copy of, and it listed all the corporations involved in this type of a project. How do I get a copy of that? Thank I'd you. like to know. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Thank you. Hi, my name's Kurt Sonnen. I'm also a Live Oak resident, and I echo all the same concerns that the other residents from Live Oak um, have expressed here tonight. Um, I, I strongly support water districts and all the efforts that uh, you all make in seeking out long-term um, water supply improvement projects. Um, um, I also support, um, in concept, uh, your um, your um, your water purification and recharge project. However, I strongly oppose the location of the site for the plant itself. Um, I also was not aware of the project um, until just a few days ago um, and um, intend to be more active in, in as this process is moving forward in ensuring that the district strongly considers other properties other than here in Live Oak on the Chanticleer site for this particular um, uh, water treatment um, facility. Um, I view that particular corridor between on Highway 1 between Soquel and 41st as uh, a viable redevelopment opportunity for the county and seeing it cited as a potential uh, industrial wastewater treatment plan I think is not the best use for the community. Um, and I think with that and said, I, I don't want to take any other time. Um, I just wanted to go on record to make sure that you are aware that I support everything that all the other Live Oak residents have said here tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, my name is Eric Blumstrand. I too also live in Live Oak. Uh, I really applaud the effort that you guys are doing to try and <clears throat> abate the encroachment of the salt water. I, I think that it's uh, uh, a, a, an issue of our times, you know. And the again, though, I do think that I I don't have any issues with the, the project itself, but I do have issues with the the Chanticleer location uh, for a number of the reasons that we've spoke about before as a community and. Uh, it's there's there's a much more viable area for our our community to bring more community in rather than having an industrial water treatment plant and i just wanted to go on record as saying as such and uh, again it is something that we've just recently heard about um and i i have to lay the blame with the, the soquel creek water district for not actually reaching out to our community and telling us that we're going to be having something put in our backyard that is not wanted by the, the, the water district in Soquel. So uh, please reach out to us a little bit more so, uh, but I don't, I still can't see any reason why this should go in the Live Oak area as opposed to Soquel. If it is such a beautiful site that's gonna be there, why not in Soquel? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other speakers, Thank you all for, for letting your, your thoughts be known. 
Um, I'll bring it back to the board if they want to say anything. This is just an informational item. There's no decisions to be made tonight. I was wanting to talk about something myself. Um, I've been out going and doing some outreach and talking to people and uh, what I'm seeing a lot of, and I think we saw it some in our comments, is that there are a lot of people that are really, I may not know all the details, but they're in love with this notion of you know, the aquifer transfer and then return uh, notion that, that would be worked, you know, it's the city of Santa Cruz's plan, but it would also apply to Live Oak, I assume. Um, and that has to do with, you know, in, in wet years, they would send excess water into some groundwater basin, and then in drought years, they'd go and take it back uh, to the city. And uh, the thing that concerns me about that is that, you know, in those drought years, uh, we normally use about a billion gallons of water for our customers each year, and the city has determined that in a drought year, they need 1.2 billion gallons to go back to them to make up for the deficit because of the drought. So that's two, over 2 billion gallons going out of the basin. Um, and uh, given that it's a drought, there's not gonna be much rain, therefore isn't gonna be much recharge, so that's not gonna happen. And then since it's also a drought year and the river's low and, and the city needs as much of it as they can get, there's not much recharge, in fact, maybe even none coming from the city that way. So no water going in, two billion gallons going out, and so what would that do? And uh, I was able to do a little research on that, and I'll show you some of the slides I've come up with. So if you could bring slide number one up. You got it. I think you I'm got not it. sure. Yeah, let us know. Now this is some work that was done in Scotts Valley. They also are considering a uh, recycled water plant there. And so what you see here are the groundwater levels of an area in Scotts Valley. And at the beginning there on the left-hand side, and, and by the way, groundwater elevations go up and down on the left-hand side, and years go across the bottom. And you see that first year, year zero, they start putting in 600 acre feet. That's about a million gallons of, uh, of water. And, uh, and each year you see it's going up and up, and it starts going slower and slower, and then eventually it flattens out. And it, they're still putting in 600 acre feet every single year, but it's not going up any. And so that means a couple of things. For one thing, it means since the water level means also how much volume is in the basin, since it's not going up, there's no additional volume being, being saved. So there's a limit to its, its level, and therefore there's a limit to how much water is gonna be in there. Now a lot of folks ask, okay, well, you know, why is that? So let's, Let's go to slide number two. So at the same time the water levels are going up in the basin, you see stream flow here is also going up, and it come, goes up slowly at first because most of the water is going into the basin, and then over time it starts going higher and higher and higher. And so at that point, what's happening is you put 600 acre feet in and 600 acre feet leaks out. Why that is the case is, you know, the, if the stream is here, as the groundwater levels go up, the slope to the stream increases, therefore more and more of the water flows out to the stream. And here that would happen to Soquel Creek and Aptos Creek and the ocean. So over time, more and more of the water you add goes out. In fact, at some point you can saturate it so that all the water goes out. So the next question would be, okay, well, so we've, we're limited, so we can only put this amount in. But a lot of people have thought, well, you know, once we get the basin restored, we're, we're done, everything's fine, we're, we're in good shape. So here you see the water levels going up as you saw before, and then there, kind of in the middle, we shut the water off. We don't put any more water in. Well, it's still leaking out through the streams and the, and the ocean and so forth, so it goes right back down again. In fact, it basically ends up right back where it started from if you don't do anything about it. So not putting water into the basin when you get it up there means you're gonna start losing it. So you have to continuously do that so for example, if you have a dry year and you can't put 600 acre feet in, it's gonna start going back down a little bit. If you can't put any in for some reason, like it's a really severe drought, it'll go down pretty significantly. So that, that says something about this basin and how you can use it and what it's capable of and, and the requirements of how you can properly use it. Next okay. slide. Now let's say you actually wanna use it like the city wants to use it and you, when you have a drought, you wanna take out your you know, 1.2 billion gallons of water. 
So that's what this model does. It's another model from Scotts Valley. And you see the blue line goes up there just like it did before. And then it gets, you know, quarter of the way over and there's a drought. So you can see that kind of gray line going down there. So within two years, it's down below significantly where it started before. And so you would end, and they can do it in Scotts Valley. It would mean they'd lose a bunch of their water. But if we do that here, that would suck salt water in like crazy because it's, it's uh, down well below protective levels. So that's, that model is my concern. And now I want to go to slide number five to show you this isn't just fun. And uh, this is a part of a report that was presented to the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Agency that we're on, the city's on, central water's on, the county's water's on, and you just, yeah, just scroll it down there. And they are saying, this was, by the way, submitted by the city. These are some of the models the city is running to test out their you know, uh, send water over and, and get it back. And it says, some modeling results presented to the advisory committee indicated water levels in key monitoring wells dropping below protective elevations during periods of drought withdrawals. So the city is finding out exactly what I found. That if, and in fact, I say, because a lot of these people think, well, it's an either or. Either if, if we are to build our project, then, then we're abandoning the city and they're going to you know, not have any water and they can't build their, their uh, Wasac plan. But I think it's quite the opposite. The only way to build Wasac 1 is to have something going into the basin all the time. Our plant will be able to put half a billion gallons into the basin every single year, whether it's a drought or no drought or anything. That goes into the basin, and that can be the key to allowing that happen without the aquifer being damaged by taking the two billion gallons out and nothing going in. So I think this is kind of a good thing to have because I think this is something that we can use to convince some people that it's not an either or, but it's rather an and, that having something going into the basin in those drought years may be the only thing that allows anything to happen. Without this, we may not be able to do either the Pure Water Project or the Wasak Project, because both of them by themselves would damage the basin. It's only by doing both of them together that we can make this work. I mean, everyone talks about working together. This would be working together. Mm -hmm. Whether you just do Wasak or just do our thing, that's not walking to get working together. That's fighting. That means our lawyers go up against their lawyers, and we spend all our lives in court, and nothing happens with water. Only by doing this about having us work together and having two sources of supply, you know, conjunctive uses, as Ron is always talking about, that's the only thing that makes this work. And I just want to add on, is, and, and that affects since San, not just Santa Cruz, but Live Oak also gets its water from the city of Santa Cruz, and they're much more likely to be able to get water in multiple drought years if we have this continual supply going in to recharge the basin. So I think it really benefits everybody, Santa Cruz and, and Live Oak and Soquel and Capitola and Aptos. So um, I just, and it also even benefits, you know, if, if they can get water on a more consistent basis because we have water in the aquifer, that's gonna protect extractions from, from streams and rivers that then can be allowed to still protect fish too in some of those critical times. So I just wanted to add on to that. So I'm going to make these uh, things, I'll give them to the staff. So yep. any of you who are doing talks or, you know, yep. to people, I mean, I think this is the one thing that shows it's not an either or, it's an and. Yep. You had something you wanted to say. I don't have any slides. <laughs> 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 but um, I've heard multiple times and through the course of being on the board well, too many years, uh, not too many years, but many years, uh, regional solutions is is the way to go and it's not easy to do that because everyone gets territorial um, and looks out for their own interests first and it's only when there's trust and when there's really um, back and forth uh, that's fairly constant that you can get to that regional solutions. And I just wanna let the other board members know, well, first of all, the, er, there's the Mid-County Groundwater Agency, 
where there people are meeting both at the agency itself and then there's a sustainable groundwater plan advisory committee where where there's a group of I think it's about a dozen or so with private pumpers uh, our district the county uh, people are representing the environment people representing uh, different aspects of the whole problem uh, meeting and coming up with the you know getting a plan together um, and something that the board doesn't know is that I'm working on trying to strengthen relationships with Santa Cruz by talking individually with with elected officials with uh, Wasac people people that we might think are against us but what I'm finding out is no they're not so until something's in writing you can't count on it but I'm optimistic that regional solutions really are possible and so and one one aspect of a regional solution is with the 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 water purification plant the location of it is if it's in Santa Cruz I think that that lends itself to regional solutions because Santa Cruz um, I think there's a real possibility that they're going to need to go to to water purification at some point and having the plant there will help them as as, as well as help the district so um, I'm pursuing that um, I just wanted to let the board know that you know I've, I've probably spent um, not a lot of time but maybe 20 hours or 30 hours meeting with people just trying to strengthen those relationships thank you I'd like to add one thing I didn't mention here this is modeling results done by the city uh, but they use a different climate model than the Wasac that sorry than, than the Sigma has used the one we use is very it's like a 10 percent reduction in precipitation this one is only like a one or two percent mm -hmm. reduction in precipitation so if this doesn't work and as I think you know climate change is going to be very severe this will be even worse okay you good are you oh yeah I just wanted to comment that I regret extremely uh, the amount of misinformation that's been allowed to circulate because we didn't do an adequate outreach on you know the to Live Oak you know I I've lived in this area for 30 years and including in Live Oak itself but in the in the 80s and I've seen that lot unchanged for 30 years and then suddenly you know what it looks like an ideal opportunity to enhance the neighborhood it's now in competition I guess there must be some other building proposals or park proposals going in right there I never thought of those that lot as a, a likely place that would have for a park or something like that because it had been used it had such a long history of industrial use and this uh, and I'd also like to contradict uh, the idea that this purification plant is high industrial it is a low industrial plant these recycling plants have been located in residential areas in other communities with no ill effects with no noise light chemical spills undue traffic this is not a high impact in industry this water pur purification but I realize from hearing all of you that how much work we need to, to show you and it might even be worthwhile to organize some trips to some of the nearby uh, recycling plants there's one now going in and down in South County in Monterey County and there's one over the hill in Santa Clara uh, the the one in Santa Clara is enormous compared to the p proposed plant here but it you know it g give you an idea of the kind of thing that it would be there's not moving parts there's uh, no clanging gears there's no oil oil fumes contaminating this this project would in involve uh, using green energy would be the energy that's used for the reverse osmosis process which is the highest the highest use of uh, energy in the, in the whole process. 
So, but I can really see, I do apologize that we didn't, um, and I know how that can happen. I didn't know anything about the Kaiser proposal that was going in next door, proposed to go next door until quite recently myself. So it just, uh, I think in general, we all have to do better. Okay, I guess I can talk. To okay. <laughs> so I, I was the one who voted against putting it in the Chanticleer side. And I believe that this project is a great opportunity to enhance the neighborhood and make it look nice while still producing water. I would rather be convincing people that live in our district rather than outside of the district, and that's why I voted against the, the project because of that. Um, I don't think it's industrial. I think it's, it could be beautiful. I'd want it in my backyard. It's just that my backyard's too far south, so it wasn't a good location. I don't have any problems with the idea of it being in a community, and I think explaining that to all of you is great, but there is still an issue where I think we should have it near our offices and on our property and in our own district. It's a strong belief I have. It's more of my own personal, um, I don't know if ethics is the right word, but it's just a belief that I have. Now, the other part is that I'm, I kind of laughed earlier because I realized that certain information that came out of my mouth was used from four different conversations and put into one piece of information that sounded like a new fact and I was confused but um, there is no new information for the EIR. It was anecdotal information about a construction project I did on a sewer somewhere not even close to your your um, lot. It was on Soquel but it wasn't that particular site. Um, I think that you know I mean, I get, I came here and I wanted to be on this board because I believed in conjunctive use. I believed in taking every piece of water that we could get and using it a second time because that's what we're doing anyway. We just don't realize it. The earth is recycling our water every time we use it. When we put it into our septic systems, it's going into our groundwater. When we put it in the ocean, it's still going up in the air and it's coming back down as rain, but not necessarily here. At least with this project, we know that it's gonna be here. And I also wanna look at stormwater and everything else, but that's a whole other subject. Okay, I think we can move on to the next item. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank you. And we will keep talking. Item 6.3, variance options. <laughs> Leslie, did you Leslie, did you want to come here? No, that's okay. I can take it right here. So, just to give a little bit a little bit of background on our on our single family rate structure, currently our single family um, fixed meter charge is the same regardless of whether you have a five eighths in, five eighths inch meter, a three quarter inch meter, or a one inch meter. Now, during the course of this last rate study, our um, rate consultant encouraged us to take a look at this, and in order to maintain equity under Prop 218, their recommendation was that we charge our single family fixed service charge the same way we would do our commercial irrigation or multifamily, meaning that it would be different for a 5 8 inch meter and a one inch meter. So the impact of that on our one inch uh, single family residential customers is an increase of a little over $50 a month just on the fixed service charge component. So what we decided to do was take a quick look at what type of customers make up those one inch single family residential meters. And we discovered that there's about four different profiles. The first type of customer is a customer who has a one inch meter because at the time their subdivision was put in, the fire department required a one inch meter to meet fire flow requirements. So they have a, a private fire suppression system in their homes. 
but they weren't the 5 8 inch meter and two inch fire service line like some of the other subdivisions. They were just a one inch service line that meets both fire and, and um, residential use requirements. <coughs> the other type of um, customer is a customer on an older parcel who has a one inch meter that may no longer need a one inch meter to meet their needs. So um, we know that there's some of those like up on Vista Del Mar um, we've had other customers call in and say, listen, I've got a one inch meter. I don't know why um, I have an older home and it's just always been the case. Then we have other residential units that are um, duplexes or two residential units on a single parcel that are sharing a one inch meter. And then we have other parcels that are served by a one inch meter and it might be appropriate that they are because of the number of fixtures or the size of the uh, square footage of the home or the size of the lot. So we took a look at these different customer profiles and we identified some variance options that we might be able to offer them if they were to request a variance from that one inch service charge. For those customers that have a one inch service that's designed to meet fire flow our recommendation would be to go ahead and set up a special service rate that charge them for a 5 8 inch residential service and a one, sh one inch fire service. Now if they're an older home that has a one inch meter that could be served by a 5 8 inch meter, our recommendation is to maybe downsize them to a 5 8 inch meter and waive the meter, meter drop in fee. The other one is a two residential unit or a duplex and we could offer those individuals the opportunity to go ahead and split their service into two 5 8 inch services. They'd be subject to service charges on both, on both meters then, um, but it would get them out from underneath that larger one inch charge. We could offer to waive the meter drop-in fees for them, but they would have to foot the bill for the construction cost to split their service. And then the last one is a one inch meter um, for serving a parcel that actually requires a one inch meter. And for those people, we would go ahead and have them retain their one inch meter. So we identified about 250 customers that have a one inch meter. We don't, we don't know how many customers meet each of these different profiles, however. Um, metrics were never kept on that. So we all we know is we have about 250 customers who have the one inch meter. So our thought would be that we go ahead and send a notice to all of these customers that if they were interested in requesting a variance from that one inch service charge, they could go ahead and contact us and we could apply one of these remedies. So it wouldn't be across the board, it would be at the request of the customer. So what we're asking here tonight is whether or not um, those customer profiles and those variance remedies um, could be approved and whether we can go ahead and send out notification to those customers that that opportunity is available to them. Great, thank you. Uh, any questions? Well, uh, well, any questions right now from Leslie? Just one. What, so waiving the meter drop-in fee, what is, what's that normal cost? That is about, that is uh, about 200, and, what is a meter drop-in fee, Taj, is it? 299. 299, <coughs> yeah, I was going to say about okay. 250, 299. Okay. Thank you, Tilly. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, does anybody from the public wish to address us on this item? Okay, seeing none, any? I move that we approve any and all of the variance options. Second. I second. Okay. okay. Yeah. Moved and second. No, I think it's a good solution. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it's great. Thank you well very done. much for researching that and thinking it through. I think and it's being a good solution. Very thoughtful. Okay. Yep, we so. need to vote. Though. All right. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. All right. There's a little water district with a heart. Little LAFCO election thing coming up. Are you doing that now? I am. I'm Where currently you alternate. Do you want to go for the, the term? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm just asking. You're, uh, you're the logical, uh, have logical priority. Um, I'd love to, actually. I'd have to find out if I can do that. I move that we nominate. 
You have to find out. I was well, just I have to, to hear find the rest out. of her sentence. Oh, yeah, I have to find out. First, I think, um, do you have to do it today? Hmm. I don't know. Oh, we can. Um, you might be able to do it next February time. February 22nd. I need to just check with my employer that I could regularly. Uh, what type of time commitment is it? Yeah. What, so the Maybe. meetings are once a month. Um, she's currently just was chosen as the public, or you know, the public. Well, no, that's the district alternate. alternate. Yeah. And Have then, you ever um, gone to a meeting? Yes, okay. yes, I've gone, and I've actually um, covered for him when he couldn't go. But yeah, she covered one meeting for me, um, and they're, they're once a month, like from ten to whenever. And sometimes there's extra things, like we were just selecting a new executive officer, which took quite a bit of time. Yeah, well, Pat and my who's big been thing. there for oh, yeah. Yeah. almost forty day. years is retiring. So yeah. whenever it is it's during the day, from mm -hmm. ten to when? Ten to twelve. Yeah. yeah. The, the I, problem I, for me would be that I don't know if I can take the time off. Yeah. yeah, and so am I, so, but yeah. I think he just had priorities. So Maybe yeah. you, if you're willing to take it on with one of one of us being an alternate, would you be willing to do that? I'd have but, to first but, see with my employer since I just got a new job. We have another meeting to come, but so <laughs> yeah. why don't you come up and do it? You want to continue this to continue the, sure. the next yeah. meeting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, bring it back next time, next meeting. Bring it back next it. time. Okay. Thank you. And 6.5. 6.5. Yeah, so 6.5. Uh, before we do that, this is a year in review, and if somebody could grab Melanie, because uh, this is her thing, uh, but maybe we just play it. We have a little, because it's kind of an appreciation of, um, of the work that staff and the board have been doing. We have a little token of appreciation, if you will, for all Can the board members. Answer? Um, is there anybody on here left-handed? I thought you were. I am. You are. Okay. Perfect. It's a left-handed token? It, it is a left-handed token. Scissors these, is the only thing I've ever... These, these all are, cups um, are right on there. Ceramic, handmade uh, mugs uh, with the uh, Cook Hill Creek Water District logo on it. Oh, uh, so beautiful. So you. And there, it's just uh, Maybe the logo comes from the story. management team uh, to you guys, to all the board members. You forgot to mention the most important part. My son, August Duncan, I made it. His oh. initials are on there somewhere. So we were all trying to think of something that would be good for you. And um, uh, let's see, there you it's go, pretty cool. Sir. Yeah, thanks. And uh, he's uh, quite the ceramicist. Um, yeah. And uh, left-handed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so uh, like this, uh, so you can. People, unless you want to see the logo. Oh, that's yeah, great to see it. Thank you. Thank you. That's really nice. Thank you. Thank your son. I will. Yeah, that's cool. Was that on the agenda? Is that? Uh, it wasn't on the agenda, but it's in the vein of uh, gratitude and and appreciation. Oh, so from all of us, we brainstormed and. If Bob was here, I'd ask whether we're able to accept gifts. Yeah. <laughs> Up to a certain amount. Now, do we have to do public? If he's, if he's these were public created. comment on that. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. And so Thank with you. that, they've put together a little video that is for part of our outreach. I think Melanie, is that right? Is that how you're using it? This went out as a video with our monthly e-blast for January. Yeah, and then when I saw it, which I didn't even know it was made, uh, I said I thought the board would appreciate this. You may have seen it uh, and, you know, looked at some of our e-blast, but here it is tonight, uh, just a couple minutes later. <laughs>
kind of ends abruptly, but um, up until today, Vi was like, oh, let me add a couple more slides. Let me add a couple more slides. And, um, you know, we've done a lot. I really want to appreciate and kind of just thank the managers who provided all of the information for us to put into there and for the leadership and guidance that the board has provided so that we can have all of those accomplishments. Yeah, and the community for their input along the way. It's not always easy, but, you know, it makes us better if we can listen and, and you know, take take clues where appropriate. Great. Thank you. Um, appreciate it. And the mugs are great. Um, written communications and correspondence. Anything on that? Anyone in the public wish to speak on that? Okay. Thank you. Then we have no closed session, and so we will adjourn until the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. In February, I think it's the 5th. It is. <laughs>